So this is very thin ice to be skating on as your spiritual leader, but I should tell you uh, that I stand in awe of other Christians for the way that they are able to live out their uh, life of faith. Uh, and maybe you've encountered these folks as well that, that leave you scratching your head wondering, what sets them apart from me? Those that uh, uh, adopt special needs children realizing that's going to be a lifetime uh, of, of, of additional work and, and, and stress and financial uh, commitment, uh, yet they do so with an incredible willingness uh, and, and sense of vocation about it. Uh, or those who uh, turn on the news and see an injustice in the world and instead of shaking their head and wishing it wasn't, uh, they somehow dig in and commit themselves to changing uh, whatever that injustice is. Or, uh, or there's people, there's, there's the doctors or, uh, or dentists or nurses that uh, uh, leave their practice uh, and go halfway around the world and give their life uh, uh, to serving those unfortunate at a considerable financial loss to themselves. Uh, or maybe it's just those that uh, seem to be able to respond to whatever the world throws at them with a mirth and a lightness and a joy and a conviction uh, that it's all going to be okay. And there are moments where I have that, but there are uh, moments where I look at others and say, how can they be so easygoing with this? How can they be so assured uh, that God is right there uh, walking every step with them? I think I begin to question whether my faith is equal to theirs. Well, did God give them an incredibly deep reservoir and make mine just a little bit shallower? And I think that's maybe what the disciples were dealing with uh, today. Uh, they've been told by Jesus all of the difficulty of being a disciple. In fact, Jesus starts this ch chapter by saying, uh, if you put a stumbling block in, and whether uh, you understand that stumbling block is something that uh, 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 separate somebody from their faith, uh, whether it be leading somebody into sin or whether it be uh, uh, just avarice and, uh, and creating acrimony amongst somebody. If you do that to any one of my children, you might as well tie a millstone around your neck and jump into the sea. That's pretty heavy. And then he starts going on about the kind of forgiveness we're called to, uh, how radically we're called to forgive. Uh, and if, uh, if you've ever been wronged seriously, uh, it's not easy. And again, I go back to those people who were able to forgive uh, the most heinous things that broke their family's uh, heart uh, and how they were able to forgive. Uh, but Jesus says that's what we're called to. That's the kind of radical discipleship these disciples were called to. And sweat starting to beat on their forehead and shooting across, uh, 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 across the room. Uh, and they're nervous. And they're thinking, Jesus, if you want all this of me, you better create a, a deeper battery pack. You better give me a lot more faith than you give me right now if you want me to walk that far into the deep end. Jesus says, tiny little mustard seed of faith. The faith that you have in spades, just that tiny little nugget of faith is enough for you to move mountains. Or in Luke, uh, to take that mulberry bush and throw it into the sea. But I think for most of us, we're not praying uh, that uh, God give us the strength to move mountains. Our deeper prayer is that God give us the strength to move ourselves. Because it's hard. And it's costly. And it's a little easier to say, well, if I had more faith, if I had more of that, then maybe I could get the gospel. And I think Jesus is talking about that uh, in the second half of the parable. And it's a parable that at least strikes me, certainly in 2016, as, as horribly insensitive. It's horribly, uh, almost antithetical to the way I understand Jesus. And it's hard for me in 2016 uh, to get to the context uh, that Jesus was talking uh, 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 in that particular moment in time. Uh, but Jesus is telling them, your identity, your being is as a child and a disciple of God. You are as intrinsically linked to that identity as a servant is to serving his master. That is how holy, you are a disciple of mine. And that's what I need from you. And when you claim that, when you live into that identity, uh, when you see that duty transforming you into that person, then following isn't something you get an attaboy and a pat on the back for doing. It becomes intrinsically woven into who you are. And he talks about the servant. He says, when the servant comes in uh, from a hard day's work,
work. Uh, you don't invite them to sit down and take a, a load off, although our instincts usually are to tell them to take a load off. Um, uh, and, but, uh, and it's worth noting that, uh, that the kind of uh, servanthood or slavery there is much different than our 18th and 19th century, but still was, uh, still was indentured servanthood. Uh, but the servant, I think part of the way that they rationalized is the servant's identity as servant uh, sort of defined their role. Uh, their role was to take care of the fields and then to come in and cook dinner. That was what they were. That was who they were. Uh, that was their relationship with the, uh, with the owner, uh, um, uh, as wrong as it may be in our, 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 our point of view. But what Jesus is saying is that's how intrinsic uh, that identity is. Uh, and that you wouldn't just invite him to sit down. You'd ask him when, where, when he's going to make dinner. Uh, and, and then after dinner, you wouldn't say thank you. Now, uh, thank you back then wasn't just a courtesy. Uh, thank you was saying, I am indebted to you. And what he's saying is you wouldn't be indebted to the person whose job it was to do that. Uh, and the same as that uh, last bit where he calls him an unworthy servant. Uh, uh, it's not that he's unworthy in his personhood. It's that, uh, it's that he's... Uh, he hasn't accrued any credit. He's just doing what he's called to do. And that's what uh, God says of us is that uh, this isn't uh, something where uh, you do a good deed here and all of a sudden God owes you a credit. This is about becoming who God made you to be. And I think of um, – I've been running recently, and I was thinking about the sermon as I was running. Um, and uh, I, I, I think even uh, people I went running with on the mission trip have said I'm not the most graceful runner. I'm a little top-heavy, and, and I run a little clunky. Uh, and I, I admire those that look like they were born to run. Have you ever seen somebody running? Uh, you know, just it looks like God gave them that gift and they've cultivated to perfection and their legs are out in front and they are absolutely dancing. Uh, well, I, well, I am working as hard as I can to move, you know, in small increments. Uh, and you realize that that's who God made them to be. They are a runner and they've claimed that and they've cultivated that, uh, you know, you, hear Jesse on the organ and you think that man was meant to play the organ uh, and that is a God-given gift that he has cultivated or I see in, in, in the teachers at the school you know a teacher that not only uh, not only enjoys the subject matter uh, but enjoys provoking uh, people's young minds uh, to open up and experience things or to, to realize those connections they can make to to grasp math in a way they've never maybe been able to see themselves capable of doing or understand that history is not just about a lot of old people uh, but of the uh, of, of the story that they're still part of today and and somehow without having to sift through papers can open that up and you know it took so much work behind it uh, but they somehow use and cultivate that gift uh, to inspire young people to be able to uh, to, to grasp things and to grow and to, uh, and to, and to be nurtured. Uh, or I think of those nurses that uh, uh, anybody who has been uh, in, in critical care and has had the gift of having a nurse that is vocationally called to that ministry, uh, that has cultivated those gifts uh, of kindness, that come in with those eyes that say, uh, I am here for you and I'm going to be there every step of the way. When you have seen somebody living into that gift that God has given them uh, and saying, that's who I am, that is my core identity. Uh, and I'm going to cultivate it, and I'm going to use it for God's purposes. Uh, you understand what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus wants us to understand is that we are called to be disciples. That it's not just taking a Saturday morning and doing something worthwhile, which is wonderful, and, and claiming our, our, our virtue because of it. It is again and again understanding that when we do that, uh, when we have that sense of duty and purpose, we live more fully into that identity, and that identity uh, helps our faith grow and begins to define us uh, as who we are as children of God. And I think one of the great things I've watched uh, over uh, the year, and we have the two largest youth groups that I've seen in, in my ordained life, uh, but they're doing a whole lot more service uh, than they've ever done before uh, uh, whether it's wood cutting or the, uh, the, the, the habitat build uh, or uh, babysitting or sponsoring a Sorodi refugee or helping with the uh, wobble, 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 run. You've got to simplify that. Wobble, wobble, run and gobble. Uh, uh, and, uh, and all of the wonderful outreach they're doing. Uh, it's not so that, that uh, uh, the, the elders in the congregation can pat them on the back and say, what wonderful work you're doing. Uh, but so it becomes intrinsically woven into their person. This is what we do because we are children of God, called to be disciples of God, uh, called to be servants to God and to God's people. And I watch our fifth graders as they put together their service projects, as they realize that they can make an impact in the world. And all of the monthly projects that all of our children participate in, the hope is that it becomes so ingrained into their personhood, that sense of duty and purpose, uh, that eventually it starts to define their personhood, uh, that they have no other 
choice uh, but to serve, that they are bound by that identity uh, as, as God's servants, as God's hands, as God's feet, uh, as, God's, um, as, as the servants to God's people. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to instill in us, that all of us are bound to that identity, uh, to claim it. And God's given us everything we need, that seed of faith, uh, to fill what we need. And the part that I think those people that I, I, I see and, 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 and I, I, I exalt and think, why can't I be more like that? I don't think it's that their faith was great. I think it was their yes was great. And it probably started off with a yes. And then it went to a yes. And then it went to a yes uh, until it began to define who they were. So I invite you to say your yes and to make your yes bold. Amen.